Introduction to A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful by Edmund Burke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful by Edmund Burke. Introduction On Taste on a superficial view, we may seem to differ very widely from each other in our reasonings, and no less in our pleasures. But, notwithstanding this difference, which I think to be rather apparent than real, it is probable that the standard both of reason and taste is the same in all human creatures. For if there were not some principle of judgment as well as of sentiment common to all mankind, no hold could possibly be taken either on their reason or their passions sufficient to maintain the ordinary correspondence of life. It appears indeed to be generally acknowledged that with regard to truth and falsehood there is something fixed. We find people in their disputes continually appealing to certain tests and standards which are allowed on all sides and are supposed to be established in our common nature but there is not the same obvious concurrence in any uniform or settled principles which relate to taste. It is even commonly supposed that this delicate and aerial faculty, which seems too volatile to endure even the chains of a definition, cannot be properly tried by any test, nor regulated by any standard. There is so continual a call for the exercise of the reasoning facility, and it is so much strengthened by perpetual contention that certain maxims of right reason seem to be tacitly settled amongst the most ignorant. The learned have improved on this rude science and reduced those maxims into a system. If taste has not been so happily cultivated, it was not that the subject was barren, but that the laborers were few or negligent. For, to say the truth, there are not the same interesting motives to impel us to fix the one which urge us to ascertain the other. And, after all, if men differ in their opinions concerning such matters, their difference is not attended with the same important consequences. Else I make no doubt but that the logic of taste, if I may be allowed the expression, might very possibly be as well digested and we might come to discuss matters of this nature with as much certainty as those which seem more immediately within the province of mere reason. And, indeed, it is very necessary, at the entrance into such an inquiry as our present, to make this point as clear as possible. For if taste has no fixed principles, if the imagination is not affected according to some invariable and certain laws, our labor is likely to be employed to very little purpose, as it must be judged a useless, if not an absurd, undertaking to lay down rules for caprice and to set up for a legislator of whims and fancies. The term taste, like all other figurative terms, is not extremely accurate. The thing which we understand by it is far from a simple and determinate idea in the minds of most men, and it is therefore liable to uncertainty and confusion. I have no great opinion of a definition, the celebrated remedy for the cure of this disorder. For when we define, we seem in danger of circumscribing nature within the bounds of our own notions, which we often take up by hazard or embrace on trust, or form out of a limited and partial consideration of the object before us, instead of extending our ideas to take in all that nature comprehends according to her manner of combining. We are limited in our inquiry by the strict laws to which we have submitted at our setting out. Circa vilum patulumque morabor orbum, unde pudo profere pedem vetat at operis lex. A definition may be very exact, and yet go but a very little way towards informing us of the nature of the thing defined. 
but let the virtue of a definition be what it will in the order of things it seems rather to follow than to precede our inquiry of which it ought to be considered as the result it must be acknowledged that the methods of disquisition and teaching may be sometimes different and on very good reason undoubtedly but for my part i am convinced that the method of teaching which approaches most nearly to the method of investigation is incomparably the best since not content with serving up a few barren and lifeless truths it lends to the stock on which they grew and tends to set the reader himself in the track of invention and to direct him into those paths in which the author has made his own discoveries if he should be so happy as to have made any that are valuable but to cut off all pretense for cavilling i mean by the word taste no more than that faculty or those faculties of the mind which are affected with or which form a judgment of the works of imagination and the elegant arts this is i think the most general idea of that word and what is the least connected with any particular theory and my point in this inquiry is to find whether there are any principles on which the imagination is affected so common to all so grounded and certain as to supply the means of reasoning satisfactorily about them and such principles of taste i fancy there are however paradoxical it may seem to those who on a superficial view imagine that there is so great a diversity of tastes both in kind and degree then nothing can be more indeterminate. All the natural powers in man, which I know, that are conversant about external objects, are the senses, the imagination, and the judgment. And first with regard to the senses. We do, and we must suppose, that as the confirmation of their organs are nearly or altogether the same in all men, so the manner of perceiving external objects is in all men the same, or with little difference. We are satisfied that what appears to be light to one eye appears light to another, that what seems sweet to one palate is sweet to another, that what is dark and bitter to this man is likewise dark and bitter to that, and we conclude in the same manner of great and little, hard and soft, hot and cold, rough and smooth, and indeed of all the natural qualities and affections of bodies. If we suffer ourselves to imagine that their senses present to different men different images of things, this skeptical proceeding will make every sort of reasoning on every subject vain and frivolous, even that skeptical reasoning itself which had persuaded us to entertain a doubt concerning the agreement of our perceptions. But as there will be little doubt that bodies present similar images to the whole species, it must necessarily be allowed that the pleasures and the pains which every object excites in one man it must raise in all mankind, whilst it operates naturally, simply, and by its proper powers only. For if we deny this, we must imagine that the same cause operating in the same manner and on subjects of the same kind, will produce different effects, which would be highly absurd. Let us first consider this point in the sense of taste, and the rather as the faculty in question has taken its name from that sense. All men are agreed to call vinegar sour, honey sweet, and aloes bitter. And as they are all agreed in finding those qualities in those objects, they do not in the least differ concerning their effects, with regard to pleasure and pain. They all concur in calling sweetness pleasant, and sourness and bitterness unpleasant. Here there is no diversity in their sentiments, and that there is not appears fully from the consent of all men in their metaphors which are taken from the sense of taste. A sour temper, bitter expressions, bitter curses, a bitter fate, are terms well and strongly understood by all, and we are altogether as well understood when we say a sweet disposition, a sweet person, a sweet condition, and the like. It is confessed that custom and some other causes 
have made many deviations from the natural pleasures or pains which belong to these several tastes but then the power of distinguishing between the natural and the acquired relish remains to the very last a man frequently comes to prefer the taste of tobacco to that of sugar and the flavor of vinegar to that of milk but this makes no confusion in tastes whilst he is sensible that the tobacco and vinegar are not sweet and whilst he knows that habit alone has reconciled his palate to these alien pleasures even with such a person we may speak and with sufficient precision concerning tastes but should any man be found who declares that to him tobacco has a taste like sugar and that he cannot distinguish between milk and vinegar or that tobacco and vinegar are sweet milk bitter and sugar sour we immediately conclude that the organs of this man are out of order and that his palate is utterly vitiated we are as far from conferring with such a person upon tastes as from reasoning concerning the relations of quantity with one who should deny that all the parts together were equal to the whole we do not call a man of this kind wrong in his notions but absolutely mad exceptions of this sort in either way do not at all impeach our general rule nor make us conclude that men have various principles concerning the relations of quantity or the taste of things so that when it is said taste cannot be disputed it can only mean that no one can strictly answer what pleasure or pain some particular man may find from the taste of some particular thing this indeed cannot be disputed but we may dispute and with sufficient clearness too concerning the things which are naturally pleasing or disagreeable to the sense but when we talk of any peculiar or acquired relish then we must know the habits the prejudices or the distempers of this particular man and we must draw our conclusion from those this agreement of mankind is not confined to the taste solely the principle of pleasure derived from sight is the same in all light is more pleasing than darkness summer when the earth is clad in green when the heavens are serene and bright is more agreeable than winter when everything makes a different appearance i never remember that anything beautiful whether a man a beast a bird or a plant was ever shown though it were to a hundred people that they did not all immediately agree that it was beautiful though some might have thought that it fell short of their expectation or that other things were still finer i believe no man thinks a goose to be more beautiful than a swan or imagines that what they call a frieslaund hen excels a peacock it must be observed too that the pleasures of the sight are not so complicated and confused and altered by unnatural habits and associations as the pleasures of the taste are because the pleasures of the sight more commonly acquiesce in themselves and are not so often altered by considerations which are independent of the sight itself but things do not spontaneously present themselves to the palate as they do to the sight they are generally applied to it either as food or as medicine and from the qualities which they possess for nutritive or medicinal purposes they often form the palate by degrees and by force of these associations thus opium is pleasing to the turks on account of the agreeable delirium it produces tobacco is the delight of the dutchman as it diffuses a torpor and pleasing stupefaction fermented spirits please our common people because they banish care and all considerations of future or present evils all these would lie absolutely neglected if their properties had originally gone no further than the taste but all of these together with tea and coffee and some other things have passed from the apothecary's shop to our tables and were taken for health long before they were thought of for pleasure the effect of the drug has made us use it frequently and frequent use combined with the agreeable effect has made the taste itself at last agreeable but this does not in the least perplex our reasoning because we distinguish to the last 
the acquired from the natural relish. In describing the taste of an unknown fruit, you would scarcely say that it had a sweet and pleasant flavor like tobacco, opium, or garlic, although you spoke to those who were in the constant use of those drugs, and had great pleasure in them. There is in all men a sufficient remembrance of the original natural causes of pleasure, to enable them to bring all things offered to their senses to that standard, and to regulate their feelings and opinions by it. Suppose one who had so vitiated his palate as to take more pleasure in the taste of opium than in that of butter or honey, to be presented with a bolus of squills. There is hardly any doubt but that he would prefer the butter or honey to this nauseous morsel, or to any other bitter drug to which he had not been accustomed, which proves that his palate was naturally like that of other men in all things, that it is still like the palate of other men in many things, and only vitiated in some particular points. For in judging of any new thing, even of a taste similar to that which he has been formed by habit to like, he finds his palate affected in the natural manner, and on the common principles. Thus the pleasure of all the senses, of the sight, and even of the taste, that most ambiguous of the senses, is the same in all, high and low, learned and unlearned. Besides the ideas with their annexed pains and pleasures, which are presented by the sense, the mind of man possesses a sort of creative power of its own, either in representing at pleasure the images of things in the order and manner in which they were received by the senses, or in combining those images in a new manner, and according to a different order. This power is called imagination, and to this belongs whatever is called wit, fancy, invention, and the like. But it must be observed that this power of the imagination is incapable of producing anything absolutely new. It can only vary the disposition of those ideas which it has received from the senses. Now the imagination is the most extensive province of pleasure and pain, as it is the region in which our fears and our hopes, and of all our passions that are connected with them, and whatever is calculated to affect the imagination with these commanding ideas, by force of any original natural impression, must have the same power pretty equally over all men. For since the imagination is only the representation of the senses, it can only be pleased or displeased with the images, from the same principle on which the sense is pleased or displeased with the realities, and consequently there must be just as close an agreement in the imaginations as in the senses of men. A little attention will convince us that this must of necessity be the case. But in the imagination, besides the pain or pleasure arising from the properties of the natural object, a pleasure is perceived from the resemblance which the imitation has to the original. The imagination, I conceive, can have no pleasure but what results from one or other of these causes, and these causes operate pretty uniformly upon all men because they operate by principles in nature, and which are not derived from any particular habits or advantages. Mr. Locke very justly and finely observes of wit that it is chiefly conversant in tracing resemblances. He remarks at the same time that the business of judgment is rather in finding differences. It may perhaps appear on this supposition that there is no material distinction between the wit and the judgment, as they both seem to result from different operations of the same faculty of comparing. But in reality, whether they are or are not dependent on the same power of the mind, they differ so very materially in many respects, that a perfect union of wit in judgment is one of the rarest things in the world. When two distinct objects are unlike to each other, it is only what we expect. Things are in their common way, and therefore they make no impression on the imagination. 
but when two distinct objects have a resemblance, we are struck, we attend to them, and we are pleased. The mind of man has naturally a far greater alacrity and satisfaction in tracing resemblances than in searching for differences, because by making resemblances we produce new images. We unite, we create, we enlarge our stock, but in making distinctions we offer no food at all toward the imagination. The task itself is more severe and irksome, and what pleasure we derive from it is something of a negative and indirect nature. A piece of news is told me in the morning, this merely as a piece of news, as a fact added to my stock, gives me some pleasure. In the evening I find there is nothing in it, what do I gain by this but the dissatisfaction to find that I had been imposed upon? Hence it is that men are much more naturally inclined to belief than to incredulity, and it is upon this principle that the most ignorant and barbarous nations have frequently excelled in similitudes, comparisons, metaphors, and allegories, who have been weak and backward in distinguishing and sorting their ideas. And it is for a reason of this kind that Homer and the Oriental writers, though very fond of similitudes, and though they often strike out such as are truly admirable, seldom take care to have them exact. That is, they are taken with the general resemblance, they paint it strongly, and they take no notice of the difference which may be found between the things compared. Now as the pleasure of resemblance is that which principally flatters the imagination, all men are nearly equal in this point as far as their knowledge of the things represented or compared extends. The principle of this knowledge is very much accidental, as it depends upon experience and observation, and not on the strength or weakness of any natural faculty, and it is from this difference in knowledge that what we commonly, though with no great exactness, call a difference in taste, proceeds. A man to whom sculpture is new sees a barber's block or some ordinary piece of statuary. He is immediately struck and pleased because he sees something like a human figure and, entirely taken up with this likeness, he does not at all attend to its defects. No person, I believe, at the first time of seeing a piece of imitation ever did. Some time after, we suppose that this novice lights upon a more artificial work of the same nature. He now begins to look with contempt on what he admired at first, not that he admired it even then for its unlikeness to a man, but for that general, though inaccurate, resemblance which it bore to the human figure. What he admired at different times in these so different figures is strictly the same, and though his knowledge is improved, his taste is not altered. Hitherto his mistake was from a want of knowledge in art, and this arose from his inexperience, but he may be still deficient from a want of knowledge in nature, for it is possible that the man in question may stop here, and that the masterpiece of a great hand may please him no more than the middling performance of a vulgar artist and this not for want of better or higher relish, but because all men do not observe with sufficient accuracy on the human figure to enable them to judge properly of an imitation of it, and that the critical taste does not depend upon a superior principle in men, but upon superior knowledge, may appear from several instances. The story of the ancient painter and the shoemaker is very well known. The shoemaker set the painter right with regard to some mistakes he had made in the shoe of one of his figures, which the painter, who had not made such accurate observations on shoes, and was content with the general resemblance, had never observed. But this was no impeachment to the taste of the painter. It only showed some want of knowledge in the art of making shoes. Let us imagine that an anatomist had come into the painter's working room. His piece is in general well done, the figure in question in a good attitude, and the parts well adjusted to their various movements. Yet the anatomist, critical in his art, 
may observe the swell of some muscle not quite just in the peculiar action of the figure. Here the anatomist observes what the painter had not observed, and he passes by what the shoemaker had remarked. But a want of the last critical knowledge in anatomy, no more reflected on the natural good taste of the painter, or of any common observer of his piece, than the want of an exact knowledge in the formation of a shoe. A fine piece of a decollated head of St. John the Baptist was shown to a Turkish emperor. He praised many things, but he observed one defect, he observed that the skin did not shrink from the wounded part of the neck. The sultan on this occasion, though his observation was very just, discovered no more natural taste than the painter who executed this piece, or than a thousand European connoisseurs, who probably never would have made the same observation. His Turkish majesty had indeed been well acquainted with the terrible spectacle, which the others could only have represented in their imagination. On the subject of their dislike there is a difference between all these people, arising from the different kinds and degrees of their knowledge. But there is something common to the painter, the shoemaker, the anatomist, and the Turkish emperor, the pleasure arising from a natural object, so far as each perceives it justly imitated, the satisfaction in seeing an agreeable figure, the sympathy proceeding from a striking and affecting incident. So far as taste is natural, it is nearly common to all. In poetry and other pieces of imagination, the same parody may be observed. It is true that one man is charmed with Don Belliani and reads Virgil coldly, whilst another is transported with the Aeneid and leaves Don Belliani to children. These two men seem to have a taste very different from each other, but in fact they differ very little. In both these pieces, which inspire such opposite sentiments, a tale exciting admiration is told. Both are full of action, both are passionate, and both are voyages, battles, triumphs, and continual changes of fortune. The admirer of Don Belliani perhaps does not understand the refined language of the Aeneid, who, if it was degraded into the style of the pilgrim's progress, might feel it in all its energy, on the same principle which made him an admirer of Don Belliani. In his favorite author, he is not shocked with the continual breaches of probability, the confusion of times, the offenses against manners, the trampling upon geography, for he knows nothing of geography and chronology, and he has never examined the grounds of probability. He perhaps reads of a shipwreck on the coast of Bohemia, wholly taken up with so interesting an event, and only solicitous for the fate of his hero. He is not in the least troubled at this extravagant blunder. For why should he be shocked at a shipwreck on the coast of Bohemia, who does not know but that Bohemia may be an island in the Atlantic Ocean? And after all, what reflection is this on the natural good taste of the person here supposed? So far then as taste belongs to the imagination, its principle is the same in all men. There is no difference in the manner of their being affected, nor in the causes of the affection, but in the degree there is a difference which arises from two causes principally either from a greater degree of natural sensibility, or from a closer and longer attention to the object. To illustrate this by the procedure of the senses, in which the same difference is found, let us suppose a very smooth marble table to be set before two men. They both perceive it to be smooth, and they are both pleased with it because of this quality. So far they agree. But suppose another, and after that another table, the latter still smoother than the former, to be set before them. It is now very probable that these men, who are so agreed upon what is smooth, and the pleasure from thence, will disagree when they come to settle which table has the advantage in point of polish. 
here is indeed the great difference between tastes when men come to compare the excess or diminution of things which are judged by degree and not by measure nor is it easy when such a difference arises to settle the point if the excess or diminution be not glaring if we differ in opinion about two quantities we can have recourse to a common measure which may decide the question with the utmost exactness and this i take it is what gives mathematical knowledge a greater certainty than any other but in things whose excess is not judged by greater or smaller as smoothness and roughness hardness and softness darkness and light the shades of colors all these are very easily distinguished when the difference is any way considerable but not when it is minute for want of some common measures which perhaps may never come to be discovered in these nice cases supposing the acuteness of the sense equal the greater attention and habit in such things will have the advantage in the question about the tables the marble polisher will unquestionably determine the most accurately but notwithstanding this want of a common measure for settling many disputes relative to the senses and their representative the imagination we find that the principles are the same in all and that there is no disagreement until we come to examine into the preeminence or difference of things which brings us within the province of the judgment so long as we are conversant with the sensible qualities of things hardly any more than the imagination seems concerned little more also than the imagination seems concerned when the passions are represented because by the force of natural sympathy they are felt in all men without any recourse to reasoning and their justness recognized in every breast love grief fear anger joy all these passions have in their turns affected every mind and they do not affect it in an arbitrary or casual manner but upon certain natural and uniform principles but as many of the works of imagination are not confined to the representation of sensible objects nor to efforts upon the passions but extend themselves to the manners the characters the actions and designs of men their relations their virtues and vices they come within the province of the judgment which is improved by attention and by the habit of reasoning all these make a very considerable part of what are considered as the objects of taste and horace sends us to the schools of philosophy and the world for our instruction in them whatever certainty is to be acquired in morality and the science of life just the same degree of certainty we have in what relates to them in works of imitation indeed it is for the most part in our skill and manners and in the observances of time and place and of decency in general which is only to be learned in those schools to which horace recommends us that what is called taste by way of distinction consists and which is in reality no other than a more refined judgment on the whole it appears to me that what is called taste in its most general acceptation is not a simple idea but is partly made up of a perception of the primary pleasures of sense of the secondary pleasures of the imagination and of the conclusions of the reasoning faculty concerning the various relations of these and concerning the human passions manners and actions all this is requisite to form taste and the groundwork of all these is the same in the human mind for as the senses are the great originals of all our ideas and consequently of all our pleasures if they are not uncertain and arbitrary the whole groundwork of taste is common to all and therefore there is a sufficient foundation for a conclusive reasoning on these matters 
whilst we consider taste merely according to its nature and species we shall find its principles entirely uniform but the degree in which these principles prevail in the several individuals of mankind is altogether as different as the principles themselves are similar for sensibility and judgment which are the qualities that compose what we commonly call a taste vary exceedingly in various people from a defect in the former of these qualities arises a want of taste a weakness in the latter constitutes a wrong or a bad one there are some men formed with feelings so blunt with temper so cold and phlegmatic that they can hardly be said to be awake during the whole course of their lives upon such persons the most striking objects make but a faint and obscure impression there are others so continually in the agitation of gross and merely sensual pleasures or so occupied in the low drudgery of avarice or so heated in the chase of honors and distinction that their minds which had been used continually to the storms of these violent and tempestuous passions can hardly be put in motion by the delicate and refined play of the imagination these men though from a different cause become as stupid and insensible as the former but whenever either of these happen to be struck with any natural elegance or greatness or with the qualities in any work of art they are moved upon the same principle the cause of a wrong taste is a defect of judgment and this may arise from a natural weakness of understanding in whatever the strength of that faculty may consist or which is much more commonly the case it may arise from a want of a proper and well-directed exercise which alone can make it strong and ready besides that ignorance inattention prejudice rashness levity obstinacy in short all those passions and all those vices which pervert the judgment in other matters prejudice it no less in its more refined and elegant province these causes produce different opinions upon everything which is an object of the understanding without inducing us to suppose that there are no settled principles of reason and indeed on the whole one may observe that there is rather less difference upon matters of taste among mankind than upon most of those which depend upon the naked reason and that men are far better agreed on the excellence of a description in virgil than on the truth or falsehood of a theory of aristotle a rectitude of judgment in the arts which may be called a good taste does in a great measure depend upon sensibility because if the mind has no bent to the pleasures of the imagination it will never apply itself sufficiently to works of that species to acquire a competent knowledge in them but though a degree of sensibility is requisite to form a good judgment yet a good judgment does not necessarily arise from a quick sensibility of pleasure it frequently happens that a very poor judge merely by force of a greater complexional sensibility is more affected by a very poor piece than the best judge by the most perfect for as everything now extraordinary grand or passionate is well calculated to affect such a person and that the faults do not affect him his pleasure is more pure and unmixed and as it is merely a pleasure of the imagination it is much higher than any which is derived from a rectitude of the judgment the judgment is for the greater part employed in throwing stumbling blocks in the way of the imagination in dissipating the senses of its enchantment and in tying us down to the disagreeable yoke of our reason for almost the only pleasure that men have in judging better than others consists in a sort of conscious pride and superiority which arises from thinking rightly but then this is an indirect pleasure a pleasure 
which does not immediately result from the object which is under contemplation. In the morning of our days, when the senses are unworn and tender, when the whole man is awake in every part, and the gloss of novelty fresh upon all the objects that surround us, how lively at that time are all of our sensations, but how false and inaccurate the judgments we form of things. I despair of ever receiving the same degree of pleasure from the most excellent performances of genius which I felt at that age from pieces which my present judgment regards as trifling and contemptible. Every trivial cause of pleasure is apt to affect the man of too sanguine a complexion. His appetite is too keen to suffer his taste to be delicate, and he is in all respects what Ovid says of himself in love. Mole meum levibus cor est violable telis, et semper causa est cor ego semper amen. One of this character can never be a refined judge, never what the comic poet calls elegans formarum spectator. The excellence and force of a composition must always be imperfectly estimated from its effect on the minds of any, except we know the temper and character of those minds. The most powerful effects of poetry and music have been displayed, and perhaps are still displayed, where these arts are but in a very low and imperfect state. The rude hearer is affected by the principles which operate in these arts, even in their rudest condition, and he is not skillful enough to perceive the defects. But as the arts advance toward their perfection, the science of criticism advances with equal pace, and the pleasure of judges is frequently interrupted by the faults which we discovered in the most finished compositions. Before I leave this subject, I cannot help taking notice of an opinion which many persons entertain, as if the taste were a separate faculty of the mind, and distinct from the judgment and imagination, a species of instinct by which we are struck naturally, and at the first glance, without any previous reasoning, with the excellences or the defects of a composition. So far as the imagination and the passions are concerned, I believe it true that the reason is little consulted. But where disposition, where decorum, where congruity are concerned, in short, wherever the best taste differs from the worst, I am convinced that the understanding operates and nothing else. And its operation is in reality far from being always sudden, or, when it is sudden, it is often far from being right. Men of the best taste by consideration come frequently to change these early and precipitate judgments, which the mind, from its aversion to neutrality and doubt, loves to form on the spot. It is known that the taste, whatever it is, is improved exactly as we improve our judgment, by extending our knowledge, by a steady attention to our object, and by frequent exercise. They who have not taken these methods, if their taste decides quickly, it is always uncertainly, and their quickness is owing to their presumption and rashness, and not to any sudden irradiation, that in a moment dispels all darkness from their minds. But they who have cultivated that species of knowledge, which makes the object of taste, by degrees and habitually attain not only a soundness, but a readiness of judgment, as men do by the same methods on all other occasions. At first they are obliged to spell, but at last they read with ease and with celerity. But this celerity of its operation is no proof that the taste is a distinct faculty. Nobody, I believe, has attended the course of a discussion which turned upon matters within the sphere of mere naked reason, but must have observed the extreme readiness 
with which the whole process of the argument is carried on, the grounds discovered, the objections raised and answered, and the conclusions drawn from premises with a quickness altogether as great as the taste can be supposed to work with, and yet where nothing but plain reason either is or can be suspected to operate. To multiply principles for every different appearance is useless and unphilosophical too in a high degree. This matter might be pursued much farther, but it is not the extent of the subject which must prescribe our bounds, for what subject does not branch out to infinity? It is the nature of our particular scheme, and the single point of view in which we consider it, which ought to put a stop to our researches. End of Introduction